I was thinking just don't get knocked out. And that's what that's what crossed in the third round. He's like, hey, man, I don't care if this is the most boring round of your entire life. Just don't get knocked out. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's not what you're supposed to tell me in the middle of a round, but it's my best. And then, of course, round three just goes ape shit. And, you know, I knock him down. He knocks me down. I knock him down. He knocks me Like, it was, yeah. I got a little PTSD from that one. All right, Jason, you're back, man. February 5th in Las Vegas. Um, oh. One thing about Las Vegas, man, it's the apex. How do you like fighting there? Uh, man, I, I honestly don't mind it. I, I kind of would like to at least once fight in front of, you know, 60,000 fans and say I've done it. Um, but honestly, when you got a coach like James Krause and Jason High and those people right there in your corner, and most times we're right there next to them, like it's 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 almost like a cheat code, having, having your coaches right there with silence – and nobody yelling at you and the fans. You can't hear anything. But, yeah, man. Fight of the Apex really ain't that bad. It's comfortable. It's familiar. It's a smaller cage. I have my coaches right there. So, it really works out advantageous for me. Having that combination of Jason High and James Krause, how is that the most beneficial for you? Uh, I mean, it's it's on all levels. Like, like if you look at James Krause, he's probably the best coach in the entire UFC. And the fact that that man wasn't nominated for, for a coach of the absolutely ridiculous. Um, and his, his vast knowledge of experience, um, inside the, you know, inside the cage and coaching and all that stuff, he's just, he really is a cheat code, but then having Jason high, who has, has years of wrestling years, like he wrestled in Nebraska, you know what I mean? So, so having his, his wrestling expertise, his striking expertise, his, his UFC expertise, stuff like that too. I mean, it's, it's a perfect combination uh, of everything you need. Is, is there a huge difference with coaches that have fought and that actually are still active in the training room for, for fighters that are coming up? I think so, man. Cause, cause James Krause is, you know, uh, James Krause, Jason Hyde, they're, they're both, they're on the front lines every day. They're doing what they're never going to ask you to do something that they wouldn't do themselves. You know what I mean? So they're saying, Hey, you, you got to go five rounds today. You got to go five rounds tomorrow. You, like they're doing it too. So I mean that, that builds a lot of trust and a lot of, understanding between his coaches you know what i mean like like it builds respect like you you respect them because they're doing what they're telling you to do instead of you know just sitting on the side and saying oh we'll do this push hard like yeah but yeah it's it's really it really works well definitely philip bro he's your upcoming opponent what sticks out most about him in his overall skill set yeah i mean he's he's well rounded he has good boxing super long perfectly fine uh decent jiu-jitsu um there's not a lot that sticks out. He can create problems, but I feel all around I am I am better than he is everywhere. He's been pretty active lately in the grappling mm-hmm. circuit. You know, what I mean, he he grappled Gordon Ryan and and I forgot who else he did. Some pretty high level guys out there. Did you get to check out those matches? And what did you think about his style of grappling? Yeah, I, I really didn't. I, I didn't watch any of them. I really, if you're my honest opinion, I, I don't care about any of them. Gordon Ryan's fantastic. He's the best jiu-jitsu player there ever was. You know what I mean? But you're looking at different styles. You're looking at a jiu-jitsu guy who's not trying to hold you down. He's he's trying to submit you. He's not really doing. He didn't have my style. Like my style is is I'm gonna hold you down. I'm gonna pressure you. I'm gonna break you until you wanna give up. And I'm hitting you at the same time. You know what I mean? These guys aren't hitting you. You're in positions where you can get beat up in jiu-jitsu and you're not. So it's just it's not the same. Um, Good for him to go out and wrestle, go out and do jiu-jitsu matches. That looks great, but it's it's not the same thing. You're not you're not getting the same thing when you fight me. I'm gonna hold you down. I'm gonna put you in positions that'll make it hard for you to get out, create your anxiety, get that anxiety going up, and then I'm gonna hit you in the same time. So I mean, there's there's a lot of different there's a lot of difference between those matches and what we're doing. When you're on top of someone, you see this a lot in the UFC. When you're on top of them, certain guys have just more power from the guard when they throw down strikes and other guys, it doesn't seem like it so much. It seems like it's just like peppering shots. What, what, sure. how do you get, how do you develop that? How do you, is there a way or is it just natural? Is this something that is born in you that ground and pound? I think it's, I think it's a little both. I really do. Um, you know, like I, I think I hit, I hit pretty hard from short distances. Like I create a lot of power um, in the guard and side control and half guard. I create a lot of power in those little positions. Um, that kind of came naturally. I think that's just, for me, a lot of that is just uh, strength conditioning. And then that's over the years, just something I fell in love with is strength conditioning. And then, uh, and then, yeah, I think it's a little bit that's just genetics, little, being able to understand how to, how to throw power and have fast-loose muscles in little scenarios, situations. 
All right. And, you know, you have a total of 26 pro fights. He only has 11. So how much of a factor do you think the experience will be in this fight? A lot, man. A lot. I think I think I've seen a lot more different looks, different guys. I mean, I fought different weight classes. I fought tall guys, short guys, little guys, big guys. I mean, I've, I've done it all. Um, and it definitely plays a factor. And it, the, the fight IQ in the cage is is a huge thing. That's something we we really rely on at Glory MMA is fight IQ and making good decisions when you should make them. In your last fight, man, you picked up a huge win against uh, a veteran, a guy that's fought everybody, Brian Barbarena. I saw you talking about, you know, maybe considering retirement if you lost that fight. Why did you have that mentality? Yeah, man. Uh, so that puts me, if I lose that fight, that puts me at three and one in the UFC, right? And I'm going to get cut. They're not, they're not going to bring me back. Um, and I don't want to go back to the, the local scenes. I don't want to go back to fighting again. Like, that's just... Like I said, if I didn't make it in the UFC by the time I was 35, I was retiring anyway. So, you know, I made it in the UFC when I was like 33. So, so it really, really helped out a lot. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't want to go back to the local scenes. I don't want to go back to fighting again. Uh, I love fighting, but that was just kind of an end all be off. I lose that fight. That's, that's where it is. The UFC was a goal when I made it. And that's, that's great. I got new goals now. Um, but at that time, if I lose that fight, it's just, that's, that's it for me. You know, you said you wanted to be in the UFC by the time you were 35 and you got there by the age of 33 and you accomplish that goal, accomplishing those types of goals, how does that bleed into like other aspects of your life? Yeah, so in 2020, I had three goals. Um, one was to fight in the UFC, one was to buy a new house, and one was to buy a gym. I did all three of those like two weeks of each other. They, they, they're just, I'm a firm believer in thoughts become things. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like what, I, what you put out in the universe really comes back, whether that's negative, whether that's positive, whether whatever you believe in, what do you put out there is what comes back to you. And I really believe that in 2020, I really made it uh, an aspect just to, to, to believe in those goals. And, and that's what happened. I think that that goes in fruition throughout my entire career. On top of uh, getting that performance bonus, I also saw that you got a brand new contract after that fight with the UFC. How does it feel to have a lot of job security, man? Some, you know, some job security in your fight career. Yeah, it, it, it just it's kind of icing on the, on the cake, man. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I got a new contract. I won the fight, and I got a 50K bonus. It was probably one of the, the best nights of my entire life, uh, especially my fighting career. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, it, it just feels good to know that, that I earned that, 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 that I, it, it could have gone the other way. I could have retired, or I could have got a four-fight contract. And then to know that I got the four-fight contract and renew that and, and to make more money and have more security for my family and, and build bigger – better things is is really it really uh it really helps out a lot putting yourself in that mind state because like that's those are two those are polar opposites man retirement and four fight contract with the ufc there's night and day so putting yourself in that mentality do you think it helps you and do you stay in that mentality now um yeah, I didn't really have like i didn't i didn't think about it people mm. ask me that like well, how did i put a lot of pressure on you I'm like i really did not I didn't think about that happening or how that, how that would affect me. I just went in and knew what I was capable of doing and, and fought my heart out. I mean, that's really all I could do. That's all I have control over. I don't have control over winning or losing. I really don't. I, I do my best I can. Um, as long as I give my best performance, I know the result will come. That makes sense. Oh, um, but yeah, there are two different mindsets for sure. Like, <laughs> like if I focus on, if I focus on retirement, I'm going to retire. Cause that's, you know, that's what you're putting out in the universe. And also you probably don't have, that much time to think about those things while you're fighting somebody else at the cage either no no i do i was thinking just don't get knocked out and that's what that's what across in the third round he's like hey man i don't care if this is the most boring round of your entire life just don't get knocked out i'm like i'm pretty sure it's not what you're supposed to tell me in the middle of the round but it's my best and then of course round three just goes ape shit and you know i knock him down he knocks me down i knock him down he knocks me like it was yeah I got a little PTSD from that one. <laughs> That's hey, that, but it was fun for the fans, you know. Uh, I think it's a one one to remember from your career. You know, you had a decent break before heading back into camp for this fight. Did how did you keep yourself busy between camps? Yeah, man. So the fight was actually supposed to happen November thirteenth. It was rescheduled to February fifth. Um, <laughs> how I kept myself busy? Uh, I started playing golf. If you want my honest opinion, I started playing golf uh, in May uh, last year. Went to Cabo for my wife's birthday, and my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, played golf, and uh, went out there and played golf with them in Cabo. And bro, I hate being bad at things, and it's so it's so it's such a frustrating game. 
uh, when I got back, I live in Overland Park, Kansas, which you know, I've been to Overland Park. You could literally hit a golf ball and hit a golf course. Like there's golf courses everywhere. Um, and we lit our neighborhood is in a golf course. So I literally just started playing golf, going to the driving range, hitting a par three course, just something like that. But really just kind of, kind of got immersed in the, in the game of golf. And the funny thing is I've been fighting for so long that I don't remember what it's like to be bad at something. I don't know what it's like to like build a skill set. Like I can have a bad day of training, but like, I'm not getting submitted five times in a round by a Brown, but you know what I mean? Like that doesn't happen. Like in golf, I'm like, dude, I'm learning a new skill. I forgot what that frustration was like. I forgot like how much it sucks to bring a new skill into your life. It's so hard. It's so frustrating. And I love every part of it. Uh, you know, a lot of high level fighters at glory MMA, you know, who, who have been your most vital partners for this camp? Yeah, we got uh, we got a lot of new people in the gym. We have, I think we have 18 fighters technically on our on 18 UFC fighters on our in the gym. Like whether they come into the gym or like we got a uh, TJ Brown fighting this weekend. We got Dakota Dakota Bush fighting this weekend. We got those guys. Uh, most people I've been using. Um, we got a guy named Ryan Lenninger. Uh, he fights this weekend. Too. God, we got so many people fighting this weekend. Uh, he fights this weekend too. He's he's tall, lengthy, uh, good boxer. Put a lot of work in with him. Put a lot of work in with Julian Marquez. Always, uh, me and him always train quite a bit together. And then we got Joseph Holmes, who's also fighting this weekend. He's a big, tall, good counter striker, good boxer, good brown belt. So I've put a lot of work in with him just to get ready for Phil Rowe, just because he, I feel like he is better than Phil Rowe everywhere. Um, you know what I mean? He's, he's a better boxer. He's a better grappler. He's just, he's bigger. So putting in a lot of work with him just really helps me kind of understand uh, what I need to do for this fight. What are your expectations against Philip Rowe? How do you see yourself getting that victory? Uh, I've, honestly, I just I see myself grinding him. It's a smaller cage. I feel like it's going to work advantageous for me. It's going to work better for me. Uh, put him against the cage, take him down, just kind of grind him out. I really feel like I have a wrestling advantage. And I really feel like um, that putting a lot of pressure on him, he'll kind of, his anxiety go up. I think he'll break. I really do. I think he'll quit. Um, and I'm not talking he's going to tap out the strikes or anything like that, but I think he'll there'll be a point where he's supposed to get up and he's not going to just because he knows he's going to take him back down and beat up again. And I really feel like it's probably – I say TKO around two or three, but uh, I'm going to put in a lot of work to just finish him quick. A lot of people, a lot of fighters, they complain about that small cage, but for you, is it a benefit? Oh, for sure. I'm exploding shit. I take one shot and I'm halfway there. Like you've looked at – I think the – the first shot I took on Barbarina, I shot from like halfway across the cage and I still took um, So yeah, it works better for me. And I thought, I thought honestly that smaller cage was going to be work against me with Barbarina because I want to get away from him and he's trying to beat the shit out of me. Um, but it actually worked out, I think, to my advantage. And I think with Phil Rowe, it's, I'm going to keep him close to me and being a little bit inside will help out a lot and smaller cage, put him in his cage faster. All right. Uh, a few more before I let you go away from the fight. MMA fans, man, they're some of the craziest people out there and some of the most passionate. What do you think fans obsess about, you know, obsess about too much that fighters don't care about, really? Um, well, that's a great question. I've never been asked that question before. Uh, I think I think fans obsess a lot over uh, like like ground and pound or just like like jujitsu and not understand. They don't understand the game. They don't understand what what people are doing. They don't understand where people are at. Like all these guys on the ground wrestling, they're sweaty, they're half naked. This is boring. You know, nobody's getting knocked out. But but jujitsu, like fighters, don't care about that because they know the positions. They understand. Hey, the, you're getting fucked up here, and they, they, a little more of appreciation for the ground game than than most casual fans have. You mentioned uh, PTSD earlier, man. I wanted to ask you about that in combat sports. You know, have you you mentioned you had you experienced it from your last fight? You know, have you seen it in other fighters around you? And does it impact you know fighters that much? And is it hard to get over? Yeah, man. Uh, the the PTSD was honestly a joke just because it was such a crazy fight. But uh, I mean, that's a, that's a realistic thing. MMA hasn't been around it long enough to understand what what the damage is done you know in the future um but around me personally no i, I really haven't all of all the fighters we have I, I, everybody's a lot more sharper a lot more smarter a lot um just just improving their lives through fighting you know what i mean like like our goal in our goal in uh head glory is to be financially freedom like using fighting for financial freedom you know what i mean like we're wanting to do what we love through fighting and i really think that's that's kind of the, the message we're trying to send. And, and, and like, I'm not, I'm not training to, 
to get hit in the face, I'm training not to get hit in the face. And so as much more training as I can do, the less the less uh, PTSD I'm going to have in the future. I want to be able to write my name. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, you're a businessman, so I need to pick your brain about this. When Kevin Lee got signed to Eagle FC, it was announced that he was going to be paid in crypto. What are your thoughts on cryptocurrency, and would you ever agree to be paid in it? Uh, I got a little money in crypto. I got a little money in Bitcoin, and I'm really pissed off because a buddy of mine was like, hey, man, this Dogecoin, this is like a year and a half ago. He said, this Dogecoin just might might blow up, might be funny, whatever. I put like 500 bucks in it, and I took it out and put it in Bitcoin, and then it blew up, and I was like, like I would have made like 20 grand off of it. I'm like, you sons of bitches. But no, I man, I think, I think with the way the government is just printing money, $1.4 trillion of just free money, it has to go like crypto has to go up the dollar's gonna go down crypto has to go up you know what i mean something has to give if the dollar's going down something else has to go up and i think i think that that's kind of the future of how it's gonna go like if you're looking at nfts and stuff like that how to buy how to buy a lot of that stuff um it's pretty crazy but i think at the moment i would not i would not take a uh a payment in crypto just because i don't know where it's going right now it's a very very volatile uh stock so i don't really know I wouldn't take that, but you know, maybe in five years down the road right now, that might be the way to go. You don't know. February 5th, man. You're back in action. You're not getting paid in crypto. You're getting paid in cold, hard cash. Jason Witt, thank you so much for the time, man. Oh, man, I appreciate you. Thank you for talking to me. Always glad to talk to you.